two and a half billion Christians on the planet. And there's two billion Muslims on the planet. And there's millions of Jews on the planet. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are the three main, major Western religions. And these three major religions, whose combined followers constitute half of the human population, believe in a God. They claim to believe in the same God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of the Old Testament and the New. And the goal of the wise in the first chapter, we zoom in on this story, this most important story, because it outlines the beginning of creation's relationship with the Creator, God's relationship with mankind. If a human being claims to believe in these books, then they have to go back to this chapter to understand it. They have to go back to the book of Genesis. They have to go back to the Quran, the story of Adam and Iblis, and the creation of Adam. If there is a creator, what does he want from us? How do we know him? How do we know what he wants? When we review the story in the Bible, and when we review the story in the Quran and we put them side by side, we find that basically God creates Adam. God decides that he is going to appoint Adam over the rest of creation. In the Bible, God makes him king over the animals and the beasts of the earth. In the Quran, God makes him king over the angels. And he commands all of the angels to prostrate to him. God says, verily I'm making a caliph in the land. Verily I'm making a king in the land. And he blows into Adam of his spirit. So he chooses Adam. The beginning of the relationship between God and mankind is one of love. One of appointment. After he appoints Adam, by clearly stating his intention, verily I'm making a caliph in the land, and appointing him by name in front of all creation and in front of the angels, what does he do? He teaches Adam the names of all things and tells Adam to go forward and to tell the people their names and to tell the things their names and to name the things, the animals and everything else. So he has a letter of appointment by God. And also he has the knowledge of God. And the third thing is that Adam is given laws by the Creator, which the Creator expects Adam to uphold. Because Adam upholding the laws of God is equal to God himself ruling. Right or wrong? Yes. If you have a Roman emperor and he appoints somebody in one of the countries to rule by the, by the laws of Rome, then effectively Rome is ruling that country. Right or wrong? Yes. The same thing here. The appointment of Adam and his rule is equal to the rule of God Almighty. Okay, so what happens next? What happens next is that somebody doesn't want God to rule. And that somebody was a very high angel. 
that somebody was the commander in chief before Adam's appointment. Lucifer, Iblis, Satan. God says in the Quran to him, to all the angels, prostrate to Adam. And everyone prostrated except for Iblis. He refused and he was of the prideful ones. God asks Satan, what prevented you from prostrating? He said, shall I prostrate to something that I have created with my own hands? You made me of fire and you made him of clay. He believes Satan at this point thinks that he's better. He has a better idea. He feels like he's more knowledgeable than Adam. He's better than Adam. He can rule more effectively than Adam. So there's a difference of opinion between God, who appoints Adam, and between one of the high angels over, what? over the throne, rulership. This is where the struggle is taking place. So God banishes Satan from the garden. And he looks at Adam and he said, Adam, I'm going to give you one command and I'm going to forbid you from one thing. These are my laws. Keep them. Do them. This is my covenant between me and you. He tells him to be fruitful and multiply. I want you, Adam, to go and you, I want you to have lots of children. I want you to fill up the planet with your kids. But whatever you do, don't approach this tree. So he forbids him from eating from a tree. Now, of course, this story of the tree, it's an allegorical one. And it would be nonsense to think that an almighty creator would banish uh, his newly appointed king just because he ate from a tree that the Lord Almighty thought was, uh, was a special tree or favored the fruit on that tree other than something else. So it has to be more than that. And I think most sensible people would agree to that. Right? Yes. And when we look into the narrations of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, what do we find? We find that they, they state this very fact. They state, when somebody asks them, what was this tree that Adam was forbidden from eating from? They say, um, was it a grape tree? Was it a, was it a wheat tree? What, what kind of tree was it? The answer comes back that it was neither. It was neither this, neither that. It was a tree unlike any tree in the world. So now we know from this hadith that they're not even talking about a tree at all. He's talking about something else other than the tree. So now the tree is a symbol for something. And we must attempt to find out what is this something. So we go back to the knowledgeable ones. We go back to the prophets and the messengers, Muhammad and his family. And we see what they say it was. We find that people had asked Muhammad and the family of Muhammad about another verse in the Quran, which talked about a righteous tree. Somebody said, what is this righteous tree? And Muhammad and the family of Muhammad said, the righteous tree that's mentioned in God's book is Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. What is the evil tree? The evil tree they say that's mentioned in the Quran, in the narrations, it's interpreted as being the Bani Umayya. Another hadith outright states that the tree that Adam transgressed against was the tree of knowledge of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. So now we know that it's that it's a tree that's associated with Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. It's Muhammad and the family of Muhammad's tree. And now we know that the tree of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad is actually not a tree at all. It's not like any tree in the world, but it's something else. And we know that it actually is Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. For Fatima is Zahra السلام, is that tree, according to their interpretations. Fatima al Zahra is that tree whereby the seed, the descendants of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, which is the culmination of all the bloodline of all the prophets and the messengers from before, comes out of Fatima in the Imams and the Mahdis.
Another narration mentions the story in detail of what Adam's transgression was. And it basically states that Adam salam, was thinking to himself, God has never created anybody greater than me. I am the most knowledgeable of all creation. How lucky am I? Isn't it amazing to be me? And as he was thinking this, and as this pride had entered into his heart, God inspired him and said, No, Adam, look above before you're destroyed. And Adam looks above at the throne, and what does he see? He sees written on the throne, La ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah. Aliyun waliyallah. He sees written on the throne the names of Muhammad and Ali and Fatima and Al Hassan and Al Hussein, the Ahl Kisa. Adam's shocked because he sees five other names and, and Adam's not one of those names. So he says, God, who are these people? That they're so great that you have written their name on your throne along with your own name. The answer came to Adam. These are my beloved. These are Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. These are my sacred. These are my, my chosen ones out of all of creation. And in that moment, envy entered into the heart of Adam. And he desired to have the rank of Muhammad and Ali. And when he found out that God had created a woman who was better than his woman, Eve, he desired that woman. And envy entered into the heart of Eve against Fatima to Zahra. Because Fatima to Zahra السلام, was better than Eve. This is what the narration states. Imam Ahmed Hassan السلام, he revealed that the transgression which Adam made was that he actually attempted to engage in a relationship. He attempted to marry. He attempted to put his hand forth towards Fatima to Zahra السلام. And for this great transgression, for this great sin now, which makes sense because it's a betrayal, it has to do with, with, a, with a woman. He is banished, and not just any woman, but the best of all women. He's banished from the heavens. He's banished from the Garden of Eden. He's told to get out of it. And his wife, for the envy that she had in her heart against Fatima, because she saw that her husband desired her, she was also banished to Allah. And yet we find in the Gnostic writings and in the narrations of the Jews, we find scenes that speak about, traditions which speak about when Adam was banished from the garden. And as he was crying in remorse and asking for God to forgive his sin, he took a stone which had a sharp edge to it and he started beating his private parts with it. And the narration states that this is the origin of the act of circumcision, that it comes from this, from Adam repenting and cutting off the flesh that is on his privates in remorse. Why would Adam cut off and circumcise his own self with a dirty rock that he found on the ground if his sin did not have to do with something which was sexual. It doesn't make sense, right? So when we put together all of these narrations, all these hadiths, when we see that the meaning even of dreams and the, and the, and the interpretations of the Ahlul Bayt, the meaning of trees and dreams is believers, then we find that this whole picture becomes clear. And the one who kicked Adam out of paradise was the creator who created Adam. And when we wonder who was this creator who created Adam, 
Who was this creator who is mentioned in the Bible as walking with Adam in the garden? Who was this creator who fashioned Adam in his image when God Almighty is far above having any image, when God Almighty is far above and it's impossible for him to be walking in the garden with Adam? Who is it? Well, we look at the Quran. What does it say? It says that God asked Satan, why did you refuse to prostrate to that which I created with my own hands? We look for hands in the narrations, in the du'as. We go back to Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. What is hands? Does God have hands? We find that the Ahlul Bayt and Salam in the Hadith, they state, we are the hands of God. We are the face of God by which faces creation. We are the legs of God. We are the tongue of God. And so now we know that actually the hands which created Adam were no other than Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. And Imam Ahmed Hassan revealed that specifically it was Ali ibn Abi Talib who created Adam. He was the hands of God. And so obviously it becomes a story of a great transgression that the first creation makes against his creator, his direct creator, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Adam transgresses against the wife of his creator and his creator banishes him, just like any father would banish his son had his son attempted to transgress against his wife. And now the story makes sense. And it makes sense why Adam was circumcising himself. And it also makes sense then why God, as a punishment to Adam, tells him, go down to the earth, you and Iblis, and share with one another in wealth and in children. And the scholars have differed greatly and pondered over the meanings of these two things, sharing in wealth and sharing in children, what possibly could it mean? And the scholars stated that sharing in wealth is when a person makes money in impermissible ways, through gambling, through prostitution, through the sales of drugs, through cheating, through stealing. This is sharing with Satan because Satan inspired these acts. And they thought to themselves, how does human beings share? And many people have asked, how, what is the meaning of this verse? How does, how does Satan share with human beings and children? What does this even mean? And the response from the scholars have been, it means children of fornication. That's sharing in, in children. It means in other, other narrations or in other, other uh, words of the opinions of the of the scholars it's that when you don't say bismillah rahman rahim before having intercourse with your wife then satan actually comes down and he engages in that act of intercourse between a man and his wife if there happens to be a child that comes out of that then that is the child of satan Imam Ahmed al-Hassan al-Salam reveals the truth about the matter. And we look into the direction of some of the Gnostic writings that were forbidden and kept out and kept hidden and kept out of the Bible. Some of the stories that were safeguarded by the Jews and their secret scriptures which actually states that Eve left Adam as he was crying after being banished from the Garden of Eden. And she goes to another land and she encounters a beautiful man who's the likes of an angel, who is actually Lucifer, Satan. And she's seduced by him. And she becomes impregnated by him. 
And God allows this to happen because he's dissatisfied with Eve and as a punishment to Eve and to Adam. And she becomes pregnant with the firstborn, Cain. Well, Adam, eventually he's alerted by the angels. He goes to save Eve. He brings her back to him. He decides that he's going to raise Cain along with Eve. And he has a second child with Eve. And he names that second child Abel. And here is where the big story of the two great bloodlines take place. The bloodline of Satan mixed with Eve, whose offspring is Cain, and the bloodline of Adam and Eve, which is Abel. The righteous bloodline, which carries the light of God, the spirit of God, which was originally blown into Adam, and the evil bloodline that carried in all of that envy and hatred and disobedience and arrogance, which was Satan. God names his successor. He chooses the king who is going to rule after Adam. Now, Adam repents. God reinstates the first covenant with Adam after it was broken. God decides that he's going to forgive Adam. Adam now is on good terms again with God and he's reinstated as, as a messenger from him and the divinely appointed king. And God chooses as a successor for Adam, Abel. Satan doesn't repent. And he's cursed, him and his offspring. But yet Cain is the firstborn. He's the eldest. And he sees himself as having more of a right to rule. Just like his father, Satan, Cain has his same qualities. Thinking that he knows better. Wanting to appoint himself as ruler. Not wanting to accept the decision of God in terms of who rules. But he takes it a step further than his father. When it becomes clear to Cain that Adam is going to name Abel as his successor, when it becomes clear to Cain that God's choice is Abel after they were both commanded to go bring an offering and the offering of Abel was accepted and the offering of Cain was rejected, Cain decides that he must climb to power by any means necessary. And in order for him to rule and to be the successor and to be king after his father, Adam, who's not his father at all, Cain decides that he's going to take it a step further and he's going to do something which is to put Abel under the ground. He decides to murder his brother. And in fact, he does. And he commits an act which is even more horrendous than the transgression that Satan did. Satan, he decided that he was going to mislead Adam and take Adam as an enemy, but he never killed Adam. Cain, though, he decides to take it a step, a step further and he kills Abel and that sin becomes the first original murder and crime and sin that's committed on the face of the earth. And that's why all other sins that are committed on the, day, on the earth till the end of time, its origin all goes back to Cain or this filthy bloodline. So as we can see, Cain, now guilty of murder, is banished in the narrations of the Ahl Bayt and is banished according to the story in the Gospels, in the Torah. He's not killed, for he did not commit any crime. For there was no law that was set down by God which forbid anybody from murdering anybody else because it was something that had never been thought of. And thus you can't punish somebody for something that you didn't warn them against. So Cain goes away freely, is banished from the presence of his father 
but no retribution is taken against him. And he builds cities and he multiplies and becomes fruitful. And Adam and Eve, they mourn for a long time. And then they have another son whose name is Seth. And God appoints him as a successor. And the bloodline of Adam also begins to multiply. But they didn't multiply as much as the children of Cain. And the children of Cain built great cities and they appointed themselves as rulers over these cities. While the children of Adam held tight to God's choice. So now two systems of rulership are being developed here. One system of rulership, which is based on the appointment of God. God appoints Adam. And then Adam appoints in his will his successor. And the successors which will follow after that. And every year the children of Adam would gather and they would open up their, their book in which they had safeguarded in there the words of Adam. And they would celebrate the naming of the successor. And they would memorize the names of the successors in the will of Adam. And they would uh, pray for the relief from the sons of Cain, which would come in the form of a savior that Adam had prophesied would come, whose name was Noah, who would establish justice on the planet and equity. And the children of Cain in their system of rule were ruling by whoever had the most power, whoever had the most wealth, got to do what he wanted to do. Whoever managed to climb on the throne was allowed to be on the throne. And so here you have the supremacy or the rulership of the people being established with Cain. And over here with Abel, the rulership or the supremacy of God in the form of Adam and his lineage, the appointed successors of Adam. And so these two systems of rule are at the very heart and foundation of the stories of all the prophets and the messengers from Adam's time till now. The mission that every prophet and messenger ever came with from Adam's time all the way till Muhammad's time and the Imams and now the Mahdi's was the mission of placing the choice of God on the throne and calling people to obedience to the true king and the true successor and declaring oneself innocent from the false kings the children of Cain, who rule with authority from creatures versus those who rule with authority from God. And that's pretty much the story of chapter one, the goal of the wise.